We well, thought that was hard, try engaging with adolescents. Um, and that's what the next presentation is about by two very brave people, Maria Bryan, who's currently nurse unit manager of the Adolescent Mental Health Ward at uh, Sydney Children's Hospital, and Laurel Mimo, who is the quality officer at Sydney Children's Hospital uh, also, and they've both uh, got postgraduate qualifications looking at um, uh, population health and public health. Please welcome Maria and Laurie. Um, good morning and thank you for having us here to um, talk about engaging young people. Um, and if you've ever worked with adolescents, you know it's incredibly difficult to engage this population. Um, so my name's Maria. I'm currently the nursing unit manager of the Adolescent Mental Health Ward at Sydney Children's Hospital at Randwick. But when doing the project, I was the educator of the medical adolescent ward. My name's Laurel Mimo. I'm the quality officer at Sydney Children's Hospital at Randwick. So today we wanted to step you through our journey and the process that we had in doing a co-design project to, in, to co-design some communication boards with the adolescent patient population on our medical surgical adolescent unit at Sydney Children's Hospital. We just want to give you a brief outline of what we'll talk to you today and we'll do a very short introduction to the Sydney Children's Hospital network and our approach to patient and family engagement. We'll share our journey using adapted experience-based co-design in engaging the young people in quality improvement. We'll talk about a little bit about what was important for us in how we engaged our patients and then what we've done to sustain engagement, particularly with the staff and the lessons we've learned, which we think is the most important thing for everybody, is what we did well and what we'd do again and what we would definitely do differently. So this is just a little outline of if you don't know Sydney at all, this is the Sydney Children's Hospital Network and we came together as a network in about 2012. So we have two uh, uh, major children's hospitals, Sydney Children's Hospital Randwick, which is on the coast and the east coast there, and then out west is the Children's Hospital at Westmead. And together we have around 350 beds, I think it is, um, with intensive care and neonatal intensive care and lots of specialty units. Then we have four other uh, facilities. We have Bear Cottage at Manly, which is a children's hospice. We have the Pregnancy and Newborn Services Network, which is based within Sydney Children's Hospital. Uh, there's the Children's Court Clinic at Parramatta and the Newborn and Paediatric Emergency Transport Service, or NETS, which is at Bankstown. And we provide, uh, we have a state referral service as well. And we do get some international um, patients. And this just gives you, we think it's important to let you know that within our network, we've built a really strong structure within our organisation to support patient and family engagement. It starts right with the board and all the way down, goes down to uh, where the staff are working within the wards. And that's where we sit, right down the bottom there within um, a unit. So it's just, uh, we just felt it was important to let you know that we felt that we could do this. We felt that we could safely engage our patients and we had the backing all the way up through our organisation to do that. So why us, why this and why now? We're going to tell you a tale of two patients, but unfortunately our project did start with um, an incident on the adolescent medical ward. Um, so I'll just read you a quick story. Sam was a 16 year old boy who came into hospital for elective spinal surgery. He came to the adolescent ward post-operatively, obviously quite sleepy and not able to mobilise, and he had an opioid infusion for pain management. Handover from recovery staff included that Sam had a complex medical history. Over the next few days, Sam's alertness and interaction with staff remained minimal. His oxygen requirements slowly increased, and he did not mobilise out of bed. Our clinical handover became like a grapevine that this was normal for Sam. After a few days, Sam's mother expressed concern that Sam was not his usual self. According to Sam, according to his mother, Sam's intellectual disability was mild. He normally had clear speech and was fully independently mobile. Once it was recognised that Sam's condition was actually deteriorating, his care was escalated quickly. 
With immediate intervention and close monitoring, Sam recovered fully, but this was a serious incident and could have had devastating consequences. A London protocol was used to review Sam's care, which is an internal investigation undertaken by the Clinical Governance Unit. And the review found that we missed Sam's deterioration because we did not include Sam or his mother in our clinical handover. So where did we start? Um, across New South Wales Health, we have communication boards used widely, but at Sydney Children's, we hadn't implemented them yet. So I'd recently come from another paediatric ward in a rural area that used the board on the left. Um, and because it had lots of colours, it was considered paediatric. Um, the one on the right is from an adult unit. But what we found is that we really didn't think these captured what we wanted and that the patients didn't use them, they were a nursing tool. So we really wanted to look at a patient focus. So we made a commitment. Our commitment was that we won't ask about or offer anything we weren't capable of doing. And whatever the kids wanted, we'd find a way to make it happen. And keep in mind, we, we were working with a group of adolescents, so we knew they were going to push our buttons. <laughs> so we printed off that first board just in A3 and gave it to a couple of our long-term patients and let them scribble all over it. We then took the colours off it and made a very, very basic what they wanted. Um, and it was really interesting, some of the feedback that we got on that first board. There was one little boy who had um, cystic fibrosis and one of the headings was diet and it was kind of for nurses, what diet do we put them on? Do we put them on a high fat or diabetic? And he said to me, do you put me on a diet when I come into hospital? I don't think I need to lose weight. <laughs> I was like, valid point, buddy. We don't, <laughs> but sure. Um, and it's just clear that that one word means something very different to people. So then the bottom right is after we gave it to our graphic design, who used our hospital colours to make it look a bit um, paediatric and um, patient friendly, or network friendly, I should say. <laughs> um, yeah. So now we're going to tell you a little bit about our other patient, and this is Tony. So Tony was a 16-year-old boy who'd been coming to Sydney Children's Hospital for around 15 years, since he was a baby. He was well known to the hospital. His family knew a lot of different people on all the wards. He had an unknown syndrome. He had global developmental delay, visual impairment and hearing impairment. However, if you did the right thing by Tony, he would always promise to take you to Fiji one day. Very nice boy he was. And we thought, given Tony's background and how well known he was within our hospital, if we could get this board right for Tony, and if Tony could help us formulate this board into a communication tool that everybody could use, we could probably get it right for everyone. So we asked Tony and his family to use the very first prototype during their stay and really get to know how it works in real time and in that environment. And this is what they gave us. So we're going to show you a little bit more, a really key point of this. But his mother told us so many things that we didn't know about Tony. And later down the track, I interviewed her about her experience in, in using this prototype. And one of the first things she said to me was, I'm not going to do this interview if you're not going to do anything with this project, if you're not going to take away and share this with other people. So that was another thing that we, we wanted to share with you today, is it's really important that we don't just listen and hear and do something, but that we share it and we act on it and do something with what those families tell us. But a key thing in what they told us. So please smile at us and just say, are you OK? Do you need anything? Please listen to us and be patient. We are struggling. And I think this really relates to what Lynn was saying earlier, that you're going to order a coffee and if you just say coffee, you'll get charged a little bit more. I thought as a paediatric nurse with 15 years experience, I smiled at everyone. Kids, babies, adolescents, families. I walked into every room smiling. But I sat and did some observation on the ward and the nurses walking into the rooms are thinking a million things. What am I doing next? What have I just done? What do I need to do when I go in here? And their faces weren't smiling. And I thought, this is something really simple that we need to change. We need to be smiling when we walk in the room. Asking if you're OK, I don't think that's a big ask for a nurse. 
but it became a real turning point for us and it really um, made us think we need to make some big changes. So having had this experience with Tony and his family, we really delved into the project at this point and we started getting lots of feedback from our patients and while he was using that board as well. They didn't like the word care, they didn't like having the hospital colours, they wanted to choose their colours in there. They didn't want it to look kiddie, so you can see the previous one had some cartoon animals on it. They didn't want to have to write everywhere all over the board. It for Tony and his family and for others who started trying it, they started saying things like, this is changing how we stay, this is changing how we're talking to the nurses. They don't have to repeat things to other people. Everything's just there on the board and you don't have to keep remembering everything. And then one brilliant 17-year-old said to us, I don't use words when I talk to my friends. Let's use emojis. And then we remembered, we've made a commitment. We're going to have to do this. Um, so we know that emojis are a really popular um, communication tool, not just for adolescents anymore. But if you can take a minute, identify with one of those emojis up there. Just one. And turn to the person next to you and with one word, describe what that means to you. <laughs> I think it means the same. Can we put our hands up? We're using Lynn's trick now. <laughs> Did people all have the same word? Because it certainly didn't sound like it from here. Um, I think mine was the middle this morning, uh, <laughs> knowing that I was coming here. But what we, what we knew is that emojis, adolescents use emojis. And why do they use them? because they want to communicate, but they want to communicate in their own way. And one emoji doesn't mean the same thing. There's no definition. There's no one happy emoji, one sad. It's, it's open to interpretation. And as adolescent nurses, it's a great way to start a conversation. And we'll show you some examples of that. So this is where our board got to. Um, and you can see I was the nurse looking after the patient that day, um, so she was pretty lucky. Um, <laughs> but what you can see in the questions and requests area, she's written, can we order some more jellies for the ward? Something really easy. I made a phone call, got more jelly. Made her stay a lot easier. She didn't have to remember to tell the diet lady when she walked around. Um, but the emoji on the bottom left, um, Another patient had used this one and I said to her, I went into the room and said, oh, are you feeling a bit cold? Thinking, I can get this girl a blanket and this is going to sort this out. And really easy. And she said, no, I'm about to have a meltdown. And that was a real turning point for me because it's, okay, let's have a chat about what you're going to have a meltdown about. And we could really stop that escalation in her behaviour. And it was around her dad not being able to come in that day so we could find something else for her to do. Um, but that was a real, um, I guess, slap in the face for me, thinking, I know what all these emojis mean. I'm cool. <laughs> I'm really not. This is another example from a young girl who had intellectual disability and didn't have a lot of language. And when we asked her what she was thinking about being in hospital, the first one she picked was that emoji in the middle with the swear words over it. And she was, she was upset and angry. And again, as Marie was saying, this meant that we started a conversation with, well, how can we help you to not feel so scared and so angry when you're in hospital? And I don't know if you can see, just written up above there, her parents had written, cotton wool in her ears, because if she was feeling there was too much noise and feeling very stressed, she liked to have a bit of cotton wool in her ears. And if she was in pain or discomfort, as well as giving her some pain relief, a Band-Aid would give her a little bit more comfort and they were things we wouldn't have known if we hadn't asked the question of how are you feeling today. Another one we wanted to give you an example of was a young girl from a rural area who came in and we'd just introduced having some um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander flag in there 
and without having to tell us, she was able to identify as having an Aboriginal background and we were able to engage with our Aboriginal liaison officer to give her some extra support as she didn't have any family with her at the time. So who we consulted with? Um, you can see the main people that we consulted with around this um, project were the patients, the families, um, consumers. We did get graphic design um, included because neither Laurel or I are particularly um, artistic, um, which became a bit of a um, struggle. Um, but we also engaged a lot of other people around the hospital, so our Aboriginal liaison officer, um, our starlight room, um, our mental health ward, um, around the emotions that the emojis might bring up. But our feedback went to graphic design. And so what we have now is um, 12 different designs, backgrounds, so that the kids can change um, which ones they want. And we've included a blank one, which is the middle left. The middle on the left, yeah. So the kids can design their own background as well. So this is them up close. This is a superhero background. Um, and we have these plastic kind of uh, perspex sleeves that you can change the boards in and out. So depending which patient's there, which one they like, they can change them. And below that, they have a little pack of emojis, which are removable stickers. Um, unfortunately, we haven't found a way around infection control. Um, so the patients take these with them or they get discarded after each patient use. And we had to order these as well, just in case anyone's thinking about doing it, to make sure we didn't breach any copyright. We just want to let everyone there know that. There is a copyright that. on There's the There's a copyright juice. issue. Mm. Um, so what did the nurses think? So initially the feedback was quite positive. The patients love it, so we have to use it. It's kind of a backhanded um, compliment. Um, but it's an excellent way to communicate with adolescents, and it's a good focus and reference for otherwise awkward conversations about how they're feeling. And we did have, have quite a young group of nurses, so it was a great way for them to be able to bring up um, some of those awkward conversations. Um, but what we found is that we'd really focused on engaging the patients um, and their families, and we'd kind of forgotten a little bit about engaging the nurses, which if anyone's tried to make change in a um, ward in a hospital, you really need the nurses on side. Um, so we kind of had to do a little bit of backpedalling and, and engage the nurses as well. So we wanted to share with you a little bit again around what our lessons were with this project and what we'd do differently again. And I think key for us was that we made that commitment to listening and acting on whatever we were told and then involving our patients in every step of the way and making sure what we did worked for them. So that commitment to saying what we could do was important. The ongoing patient engagement. There were some financial constraints, the cost of the Perspex board and the cost of getting the emojis meant that we had some limitations as well. And the sustainability has something that we had thought we'd considered by getting the permanent boards, but what we hadn't considered was that there might be other changes that come in, such as where the engineer decided to stick it up on the wall, because previously we'd been moving them and he put them where he thought was the best spot. So we're now working to move them a little bit. The other issue we had is that the whole hospital got new beds and those beds don't sit like the other beds used to. So now we also have to work around how do we move where we'd put all the equipment into a place where it doesn't interfere with where the beds are and where the emergency equipment is. And that's nothing, that was things we didn't have any control over, but it's an important thing to remember of there are things that are going to change. There's also the roles within the ward and the changes in the uh, acuity of the patients. So they've had a change of nursing unit manager, they've had a change of educator, and they've had a change in the type of patients they now take on. And there are all sorts of things that we have continued to work with the ward to help them move through. And again, as Maria was saying, because we focused, as we got towards the end, we were focusing more on the patients, we sort of left the staff out of it and we didn't want to burden them with the extra work of put, you know, cutting up the emojis, trying them and teaching the patients. But I think by doing that, we started to exclude them a little bit. So we're now working with them again to say, how do we make these boards, boards work? Where do we move them to now that we've had some changes? So can it work elsewhere? Initially, we had a lot of interest um, across the network of people wanting to implement the emoji project. 
Um, but what we really had to work hard to tell people was it's not about the emojis. It's about engaging your patient group and asking what they want. Because for some of our, our neonatal intensive mm. care ward, emojis may not work. It's about asking the families what they need. Um, we were lucky that we had the kids that suggested it and we worked hard to make it happen. Um, but we have implemented, um, or started to implement it on the adolescent mental health ward. Um, and it does look very different um, because there's different needs. And we've got our traffic light system down the bottom um, and our kind of scale of emojis down there. Uh, where to from here? So on, we're looking at ongoing engagement with patients and families and looking at improving the boards. Um, we know that this isn't the final product. This will change, adolescents will change and I'm sure they'll want something else um, or some, some new technology um, will come on board. We are looking at how we can make them electronic um, but that's quite a big process. Um, we'll continue to work with Allied Health and with the medical teams um, to engage them in using the boards as well and continuing to ensure the project's sustainable, um, which continues to be a challenge. And we've just got a short video for you um, that we'll play, um, but can I just ask that you don't film the video just because it has a patient in it, um, and patient, the patient has consented for us using the video here, um, but not for elsewhere. Thank you very much indeed. That was fantastic. Thankfully, most dental services do not involve uh, hospital stays, although it's a common cause of hospitalisation for children. Um, how, does it, how do you think it would work in an outpatient environment where the interaction is transitory, um, using this sort of technique for engagement? You know, you've got somebody coming in, they're coming in for a fluoride application or fissure sealing or a filling, and, but you want to actually do a more holistic care with an adolescent using emojis. Have you thought that through about how it works in a more, when you don't have somebody on the ward for five or six days or five or six weeks? Um, I think, sorry. <laughs> I think you could use it as kind of a pre um, cursor to coming in, <laughs> um, in its electronic form. So sending it out to the patients, seeing how they feel about coming in. So then you're a bit prepared of this patient that you're going to, um, going to receive but it also um, just gives you that prompt for a conversation of what does this mean why why did you put that one how does that make you feel or what's going on in your life outside of here yeah, yeah and I'd, I'd also be interested to see what the um, experts in that area would think of in um, if people have been working out patients or working in dental services you know what what the approach is is when patients come in the room so what are you thinking in your head might be helpful like so, I, I, so in some yeah. retail environments they've got you know four four or five punch buttons where on the yeah. way out you punch your emoji mm. but what you're saying is that actually it's possibly more useful on the way in yeah. to engage i've got time for we have, we're running out of time but i think it's an important conversation any quick questions or comments look thank you very much that's been really valuable thank you thank you, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, 